So you're asking yourself, what is Hitch? Hitch is a mobility platform and we focus on the daily commute. This is the distance between home and work. It can actually be the distance between anywhere and any other place. This is the action of going between these two places. It's a journey that happens every day. This is what smart organizations around the world are currently focusing on, influencing and tracking. Hitch is a smartphone app that is open to the general public. And that makes us different. You can use Hitch today and quite simply in just a couple of seconds at the start and end of anyone's daily commute. Organizations like yours, leaders like you can leverage the platform to track and reward the mobility behaviors that they wanna see in their workforce or in their community. To use public transportation, to return people to the confidence of public transportation with incentives, to carpool, to use less congested corridors, maybe remote parking, shuttles, and to commute during less congested times. We are sharing a vision with you about how we can get everybody participating to retire carbon offsets for every mile they track. And we're celebrating every walk or bike commute. Hitch delivers incentives that influence smart mobility decisions and Hitch tracks that mobility in order to validate improvement, to demonstrate that your organization's sustainability goals are being met. So behavior change, that's what we all wanna see. On a mass scale, maybe not as painful as the change we've seen in this pandemic, but we know that change at this scale is possible and I believe that it can be managed. So think about how we changed our understanding and our behavior at scale in the past. And let's see if you remember these messages that changed the world. In the time it takes to grow a tree, you can grow a country. Four score and seven years ago. It only takes a minute to wipe out a century. A flash and nothing. And even the birds won't come anymore. It only takes a careless moment to turn this into this. Don't let forest fires be your fault. Make sure your fire is dead out. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. I'm Woodsy Owl, and I'm here to tell you about a dirty word, pollution. Help Woodsy spread the word. Never be a dirty bird. Hoo hoo! Don't paint a ride on buildings. That's pollution. Give a hoot. Don't pollute. Never be a dirty bird. We don't always die from tobacco. Sometimes they just slip out your tongue. And you won't sing for the act with a big hole in your neck. Cause you don't always die from tobacco. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. I don't know about you, but I remember all of those messages and I believe that we can learn from them, that we can drive major sea change when it comes to mobility through education, engagement, and science. And we're seeing that right now, the new messages that can nudge behavior change. Take a look at this.
So here's the problem. Who needs to get to work? How do we get them there? Our solution is already in place. There's a road to almost every home. There are 273 million cars on the road today. It's a good place to start. A car is in almost every household. And there are family members, friends, and coworkers who are able to drive and ride together within trusted circles. The newly coined COVID car term is gonna be driven among these trusted circles. And that's how we're gonna to get to work for a long time. At Hitch, we say, embrace that and make it work because it is working. So mobility is essential. Social and economic justice is essential. Housing policy, redlining, segregation in all of its forms. This may be the root of our cause of conflict today, but our lack of imagination in mobility policy is the root cause of our failure today. So as Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Frey put it, we need to make sure that the precision of our solutions matches the precision of the harm initially inflicted. So I'd like to welcome now to the stage, our first guest who will speak about the costs and what we've learned from the data. He is Charlie Apigian, the director of MTSU's Data Sciences Institute. Charlie, we'll pull you up from your table and welcome, and please share with the team what you've learned from studying the data. How do we, um, how do we make change happen? Thanks, Mark, and thank you so much for the opportunity. I have uh, been involved with Hitch since its inception back uh, in early 2018 when they started collecting data through the Data Science Institute at MTSU, and Mark was uh, first and foremost, looking at being a data-driven startup. And we had the opportunity to look at his data from day one to really see if incentivizing people to ride share does make a difference. Hitch wanted to see what is the true cost of incentivizing uh, riders to, to make a difference? And also, did they build a system that was robust enough to not only handle just ride sharing, but other forms of mobility, such as obviously solo rides, um, contract tracing, if it needed to go to that, or at least a pledge before you started driving. Could it um, uh, help with mass transit, biking, walking, anything that you can imagine? And so I got to go in and really look at their database and see what it is built for and can it scale? The other thing that we looked at doing this uh, summer was helping the US uh, DOT with a report that they were doing on ride sharing. And we got to work with uh, Alan Greenberg on his report. And we were able to dive really deep into what matters to help continue to make a difference in terms of mobility. During that time, we looked at over 12 million total miles that were in the Hitch uh, system. That's 15,000 uh, different users, and it was 357,000 unique trips that were part of that initial pilot uh, program. So I'm gonna give you the, uh, uh, the, the good nuggets. And when you look at it per mile, what we found is a major jump between a penny and two cents. And once you got to two cents a mile, for each of the riders. It continued to in incrementally go up to about five cents uh, to make a big difference, but that was really the sweet spot that we saw is between two and five cents, and two being the minimum that it would cost to truly incentivize, and we saw a sustained use. And sustained use to us was, were they still using it in three months, six months? And we saw that if you were paying somebody two cents a mile, 48% were still using it in three months. 33% were still using it in six months, which we thought was pretty big. So what does two cents mean? Well, let's say that the average user, their trip is 14 miles per trip. They average 177 miles uh, for the month. And if you look at 177 miles for the month at two cents, you're talking about $3.54 per user. If you wanted to incentivize 1,500 different users at two cents a mile, that would cost you $5,000 per month. And with that, let's get to the other good stuff in uh, uh, our presentation today. Thank you so much for letting me dive into this data and being part of this journey to get us to where we are today. I look forward to seeing what the next steps are. 
Yeah, thank you, Charlie. I really appreciate it. Now I'd like to welcome to the stage Michael Skipper. He's the executive director of the Greater Nashville Regional Council. Michael is uh, taking this into the phase two project where we're going to have him converse about engaging people directly in mobility incentives driven by public policy and how we're going to accomplish that. And I, I would love to welcome Michael Skipper to the stage. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today with you. Like Charlie, I've been uh, with you at the, the very early stages of Hitch and I've had the chance to see it evolve over time into what has really turned into an amazing rewards incentive program to drive good behaviors across uh, our, our region here in Middle Tennessee as well as across the nation with respect to transportation. And, and I know you've got even even bigger ideas for the use of Hitch as a platform to incentivize behaviors, even beyond mobility. We are looking forward to uh, deploying Hitch across Middle Tennessee uh, in, a, in a broad sense. We've had a few pilot projects that have been mostly employer driven over the last couple of years. But um, as, a, as a result of a, an opportunity through a federal grant program that we manage at the Greater National Regional Council, we now have uh, an opportunity to look at how we can affect behavior sort of at a larger scale across Middle Tennessee. Just as a way of introduction, uh, again, I'm Michael Skipper with the Greater Nashville Regional Council, which is a council of governments for 13 counties and 52 cities across uh, Nashville and Middle Tennessee. One of the most important responsibilities we have to Middle Tennesseans is in carrying out the federal metropolitan planning organization uh, programming for our metropolitan areas. As, as many of you that are signed on today know that you know sort of uh since the since the 60s the federal government has been increasingly delegating decision making authority for how federal gas tax dollars are spent on transportation projects to local governments within metropolitan areas across the nation and they're they're asked to do that in cooperation with each other and the state dot and transit agencies and so our role in that is to facilitate that collaboration amongst the transportation stakeholders in our region and to allocate the federal funds that we expect to come our way uh, tomorrow and 25 years down the line. Um, since 2010 in, in this role, what we've elected to do is to set aside 30% of a particular federal highway administration grant that comes to Tennessee in all states in America, but 30% of the money from the surface transportation block grant program that flows to uh, our region uh, is set aside uh, and dedicated to projects that are aimed at improving active transportation choice within Middle Tennessee or accelerating the deployment of technologies um, uh, for public transit, uh, transportation demand management, traffic operations. So we're looking at emerging technology, trying to figure out how to pilot or sort of accelerate their deployment uh, through, through this 30% set aside. So we've been doing that since 2010. And more recently, about a year ago, our board um, held a, a completed sort of a a process, a, co a competitive process where it looked for uh, proposals from across the region for how to spend about five years worth of this money on technology solutions that were specifically aimed at transportation demand management or outreach and engage engagement with the community uh, to uh, better brainstorm and collaborate with uh, local neighborhoods on transportation solutions that would be beneficial uh, to, to, to their personal life. And so as a result of that competition, which Mark and Hitch applied for uh, our Transportation Policy Board, which oversees that NPO process and allocating federal grants to transportation projects across Middle Tennessee, elected to award about a million and a half dollars in federal funds to Hitch uh, in exchange for uh, a, a broad scale deployment of this rewards or incentive uh, program. And so um, we had a few objectives that we we're trying to achieve uh, through this initiative. One was we wanted to figure out a way, sort of low cost way of addressing some of the very specific transportation challenges which is frankly hard to address through big roadway construction projects or even big rapid transit projects that take some time to develop. We wanted to see what we could do to, at a low cost, uh, begin to drive changes in personal choice with respect to commuting to work. Uh, and so our, our intent is to use Hitch, design uh, financial incentive reward rules that incentivize people for carpooling or transit usage uh, on the way to and from work. We also wanted to encourage or reward people uh, in making personal choices that avoided peak travel times. And so we intend to use 
this, uh, this platform to basically vary the rate of reward based on the time of day that you're traveling. So they're incentivized more to avoid uh, those peak periods. Uh, and to some extent, we all have a little bit of discretion when we travel. And if we have a little bit more encouragement on maybe starting uh, five, 10 minutes earlier than we otherwise would have, or five or 10 minutes later than we otherwise would have, you know, we can make a big difference in terms of uh, the sort of the aggregate number of cars on the roadway at any given time. Uh, another thing that we're trying to do with the Hitch platform is to incentivize or reward people um, to go above and beyond, or maybe even a little bit out of their way uh, to pick up a, a carpooler uh, that might be coming from uh, a part of the region that is traditionally underserved. And, and what we're really aiming at here is to make sure that people uh, they don't have really good access to cars and so low income folks or just people who've chosen to not have um, enough personal automobiles to go around the household. Um, let them benefit from uh, other people being incentivized to, to pick them up on their way to work. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, really try to figure out a way to uh, provide more, uh, a higher level of transportation service to uh, lower income areas or areas with just a lower rate of uh, auto uh, availability. Um, and then we're also exploring a, a few uh, concepts that would reward freight uh, to better you know, take, take better advantage of the, some of the recent roadway construction projects that we built around you know, that go around the, the core of the region. Uh, what we see is you know, we built some, um, some pretty big uh, bypasses, if you will, around the, the downtown urban core, but we're, the, 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 truck, uh, the truck drivers are sort of lagging behind in terms of their decision to use those facilities versus sort of you know, continuing to blow through downtown. Uh, downtown, which is uh, significantly contributing to particularly those peak um, travel uh, periods that we experience or did experience pre-COVID. Um, but we do have beyond just the idea of changing travel behaviors, um, a few additional objectives that we wanted to achieve with the platform. One is we wanted to establish a more direct relationship with users of the system, which is one of the sort of byproducts of Hitch is the ability to talk directly to Hitch users. And what I mean by this is that we can periodically uh, check in with them with a poll here or there to understand like what their experiences are on the roadway. Not, not just their experiences using the Hitch application, but what are the day-to-day -day challenges that they're experiencing um, as a commuter or somebody who's trying to get around the region. So uh, that ability to talk directly with commuters through the through the application, I think is going to be big, especially knowing that they're already bought in. They're more likely to pay attention to us when we're, we're seeking their input into uh, either the planning process or just, just to better understand their experiences. And then another benefit from the uh, platform that we're looking forward to, to taking advantage of is just the enormous amount of data that's going to be collected from the users of the system, just passively, uh, the, the sort of the origins, origins, the destinations, the travel speeds, the routing data that's going to come along with uh, the system to augment the, the traffic uh, modeling that we're doing that's traditionally based on household travel surveys that are very infrequently conducted to assess sort of the behaviors of our region. So it's a little bit more real-time understanding of what's really going on. Of course, that'll be... Um, um, greatly supplemented by big data that we're getting from uh, the mobile device data that's out there as well. But uh, anyway, I just, you know, before I turn it back over to Mark, uh, again, want to thank uh, Mark and Hitch, everybody at Hitch really for their leadership on this issue. I, this was a, this was not an obvious business idea, I don't think for a lot of people. And some of the early versions of Hitch were, were, were very interesting. So I just really love how Hitch kind of stuck with the problem statement and kept innovating to a point where, we're fully bought in. Uh, and I, I'm really proud of our city and county mayors who are bought into this. I'm really proud of our uh, partnership and collaboration with the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration who have, uh, who have you know, been uh, willing partners in our decision to use federal highway dollars for a program such as this. So again, Mark, thank you for your leadership uh, and look forward to Q&A, but uh, time back to you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, what, what most people have a tough time understanding at some point is that the Greater Nashville Regional Council would be the definer of the rule sets that determine what is smart, what is not smart, what is helpful to the community, and what is not. 
And those rules change and they're very dynamic. So people in their daily commute can experience that. And the interaction, the relationship that you'll have is direct. And that's a part of what we're talking about today is how to get people from where they are to where they need to be for work today and how to get them from where they are to the city of tomorrow that we're all trying to get to. And with that, I'd like to introduce James Kuffner. You are the architect of Woven City. We have a lot of people asking questions over here in the QA already. Uh, so you you are driving this boat and you are the autonomous uh, engineering and thought leader at Toyota. And uh, I should just say thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to have uh, the chance to talk to so many uh, esteemed uh, colleagues and uh, passionate people around the world. One of the things that I've been working on for my career is trying to create new technology for mobility and also to really think about how technology can help humans live happier, healthier, better lives. And that's really what's driving uh, the Woven City uh, effort. So um, I had prepared uh, about a, a 10 minute presentation. So I'm just gonna quickly uh, present that and then leave most of the time for the discussion. Um, but when we are thinking about human activity, what you can see is that, you know, for thousands of years, people have been moving and building things and communicating and thinking. And we've developed manufacturing technology that uh, have uh, allowed us to build things, uh, transportation technology that has helped us move farther and faster than we ever could. And, and using manufacturing technology to build some of those uh, solutions in transportation. Uh, and then of course, something we've all lived through is the revolution of information technology, allowing us to communicate uh, using platforms like we're using today. Uh, but what is really interesting is that now we have artificial intelligence, which is essentially allowing us to accelerate and augment our thinking. And the computer is, of course, the most complex device that humans have ever built. And in fact, today's computer cannot be built without a computer. And in fact, uh, it isn't just a single computer. We now have data centers, network connected, thousands of CPUs that are able to solve problems at a scale that was unimaginable uh, just a few decades ago. And of course, when you connect a computer to the physical world, uh, you get a robot, something that uh, uses computation to change the world. Or instead of processing bits of information, we can now process atoms. And connecting that to the cloud means that we can create all kinds of new possibilities, whether it's um, cloud-connected vehicles or cloud-connected machines and robots. So one of the things that we've been looking at is how does all of this uh, new technology impact the way we live? And I think in many examples, uh, disruption and transformation comes with strong partnerships between the industry, scholars and government, and also dedicated people and capital to make change happen. This is part of the reason that I became an early investor in Hitch. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but. Uh, for me, uh, some of the first experiences I've had is in the DARPA Grand Challenge, where the government invested in trying to accelerate automated driving technology by inviting universities and companies to build uh, proofs of concept and have competitions. I was involved with the Carnegie Mellon team um, in uh, when I was a professor there. And then um, after that happened, Google recruited a lot of the people that were building those tools and technologies uh, to try and uh, accelerate it. And then of course, uh, that has uh, increased uh, dramatically now, uh, that division is spun out as Waymo. But there's an explosion of research and development activity in this area, because I think people are realizing that it has a chance to completely disrupt a lot of our mobility and transportation systems. I think the key point is data is critical. And we saw earlier this morning, how data about commuting and data about how people are moving in our urban environments is essential to make uh, good dec decisions and judgments and also to incentivize behavior. When we think about machine learning, 
What's so interesting today is that any one of us could right now download the most advanced machine learning algorithm. It's mostly open source. You can get the state of the art software right on your laptop today. The problem is you wouldn't be able to do much with it without data. And it's not just quantity of data, but it's really quality of data and diversity of data. If I have millions of miles of data of driving in an abandoned highway in Arizona, I'm not going to be able to train a machine learning system that will help my car or my robot navigate through the streets of San Francisco. So that is one of the keys that is uh, uh, essential for this technology. And now I'd like to think about how this technology will impact the design of future cities. Um, we're seeing this uh, concept of true driverless cities where everything could be um, on demand. Uh, you could essentially have all of the services of people, goods, and information uh, delivered uh, for you. And COVID has actually accelerated the thinking about it because so many people are uh, ordering food or ordering goods to be delivered and staying at home and remote working. Um, this, of course, could lead to a dramatic reduction in traffic, noise, and pollution. Some of the things that the Hitch platform uh, is also uh, aimed at reducing. Uh, and then if you think about city design, um, so much land that is currently dedicated to parking lots could be converted to better uses. Um, on that point, um, the interesting part about the current reality is that the average car has a very low utilization. It's parked 95% of the time with only 5% on the road, whereas uh, urban drivers often spent up to 20 minutes just looking for parking. And of course, with connected cars and with smart cities, we could dramatically reduce that wasted time. Um, the United States has about a billion parking spots, uh, but only uh, a quarter billion cars. And therefore, we have four times more parking spaces than vehicles, which is, of course, isn't a great use of our land. Um, in the Los Angeles is probably one of the uh, most challenging urban centers, they have 200 square miles of land dedicated to parking, which of course could be used for much better purposes, uh, and about 18.6 million spaces. It's 14% of all the land area in Los Angeles, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, what we can think about tomorrow is we will have, uh, of course, a relocation of parking structures away from urban centers. You can actually build completely automated centers. They have them a lot here in Japan. Um, that dramatically reduce the, the space needed for parking. Essentially, you can have more dense and uh, robotically managed parkings. You can also have uh, denser uh, packing because you don't need to have humans moving around those spaces. But the data-driven dispatch of this transportation and dynamic load balancing uh, will dramatically improve the efficiency and um, of utilization of not only people's space, but also time. I think also in the future, they can double as charging stations as well as maintenance for these shared mobility. And of course, maybe in the future, they could become logistics hubs. That means that if you order something online, it can be delivered directly to the trunk of your car. And in the larger sense, converting uh, these parking spaces and gas stations to green spaces would dramatically improve the livability of many of our cities because now we can install uh, green bike lanes or expanded sidewalks. And uh, you could also think about having underground spaces, uh, much like the Fußgänger zone is pedestrian zones in Germany or other parts of Europe, uh, the urban centers are very vibrant and safe when you have no cars moving at high speeds in the centers. All of this, uh, these technology changes and these possibilities has led Toyota to start thinking about smart cities. And so early in January, before COVID hit, uh, we announced at the Consumer Electronics Show, um, uh, our president Akio Toyota and uh, famous architect Bjarke Ingels uh, are collaborating on building the Woven City, a smart city 
where we can test uh, these new technologies. It's at the base of Mount Fuji. This is the uh, rendering of what it will look like when complete. And the goal is to have very much human-centered uh, living laboratory that is ever evolving and really trying to explore how these new technologies could transform the way we live and work in the future. Um, this is the site. Um, it's about uh, 0.7 square kilometers. It's the site of the old uh, Higashi Fuji plant. And um, this is going to start early next year. Uh, we're already deep underway with the designs. But one of the things that is uh, interesting is that as these technologies come together, it's not just the infrastructure that we build that can create a better living environment, but it's really about the behaviors. And that's where I think Hitch and the Hitch platform comes in, is that how can we create incentives and create infrastructure for people to have good behavior that contributes to uh, less pollution and uh, better quality of life. This is a digital twin uh, rendering. Uh, we are now building, of course, uh, detailed 3D models of what Woven City would be like. Um, it's meant to have smart mobility uh, connected as well as uh, sustainable construction, uh, mass timber-based construction um, that will allow people, goods, and information to move seamlessly uh, within the city. Of course, it isn't the city itself that is important. It's really the fact that we're able to test some of these new technologies at scale uh, with real people who are living and working in the environment um, and, and then take that technology and uh, utilize it for all of the cities of our world that are growing and increasing uh, demands for energy efficiency, sustainability, traffic, and pollution. Uh, so that were the mostly the prepared remarks that I had today, and I wanted to have uh, the rest of the time for a good discussion. But for me, I feel that the uh, technology and the uh, platforms such as Hitch that are allowing data and incentivizing good behavior are going to lead to a much better solutions for our planet. And that's something that I'm really passionate about, and I'm uh, really excited to talk with all of the other passionate people here gathered. Uh, to find solutions for our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. The first question you're going to get is actually from the president and CEO of the Center for Automotive Research. Her name is Carla Bello. You yeah, thank you, Mark, and great presentation, James. Nice to see you. Um, you were speaking my language when you were talking about smart cities and uh, this uh, idea of you know seamless transportation and green environment these are all things that we're studying here at the center and i posted a question in the q a about the citizens involvement in really creating what this image should look like and why is their involvement critical to the different technological solutions that you may choose and then can you also elaborate a little bit on public private partnerships and why those are so important in this kind of a, a multidisciplinary um, uh, offering for the for a new way of living yeah so for your first question uh, thank you very much and great to see you Carla um, the Citizen involvement, I think, is crucial because, um, you know, how people uh, living their lives, the choices that they make, um, they're part of a community. We're all part of a community and having a voice um, to how we prioritize infrastructure and how we prioritize the investments in our communities, I think, is very, very essential. It also means that you will get good ideas because you will have a diversity of people in different situations with different needs. So giving those people a voice, I think, is essential. And that uh, leads to the second question, which is why is uh, government uh, public-private partnership so essential? Um, the public service sector uh, helping um, organize our communities, provide sustainable, uh, efficient, safe mobility for everyone. Um, the industry has been developing technology and um, and we've been trying to create this uh, efficient uh, uh, energy, uh, effective solutions and safe mobility, but we need uh, regulations and we need to cooperate with governments to bring it to market. 
And that is something that the, um, the auto industry, but uh, many other industries uh, rely on in order to have our uh, technology uh, making an impact. Uh, otherwise it will be living in the laboratory and not able to make an impact. So for me, I feel it's essential that we need to have these dialogues and have these strong partnerships. And uh, without that, uh, we will not make forward progress. Thank you. And and Michael, I, I have a question about behavior and changing people's behavior. I, I think Hitch has a wonderful platform to do that with incentives. We see a lot of places around the world that are using a stick as well. Um, I don't know if it has to be a combination of both, but in your work so far, what are you finding is really driving a change in consumer behavior? Well, you know, just to be clear, we haven't yet deployed Hitch across the region yet, so we're more you know, my remarks earlier uh, today were more about sort of where we're headed with respect mm -hmm. to the rewards program. But, you know, I think, you know, just and this kind of links back to your previous question about citizen engagement is that a lot of times transportation planners engage the community about solutions for the future. And then, you know, we brainstorm all these great ideas. And then if the product is always going to be like a hundred million plus dollar construction project and climate where there's not enough money to build that stuff in the next 20 years. It's sort of deflating. Um, it's also the public, I think it's frustrated when the only solution that government presents back to them is a big construction project. I think those construction projects need to happen and they need to happen in a, in a well-designed way that's suited for the 21st century. It's not the construction projects of the 60s, 70s and 80s. But I think the public really appreciates uh, solutions like Hitch because it's immediate impact. Uh, they're part of the they're part of the solution right now. It's also a demonstration of our commitment to thinking about um, solutions that are lower cost and and more more sort of real time impactful. Um, I think uh, you know also linking back to the previous question about the. Uh, private sector uh, partnership here. I didn't mention this earlier, but another benefit of the program with Hitch is that, you know, most of this federal funding is 80-20, right? 80% federal share, 20% mm -hmm. non-federal share. And most of our projects tend to be, the other 20% comes from the government as well, just the state or local government. And so in the case of Hitch, you know, what Mark has committed is working with the private sector to raise that additional capital uh, to match these federal funds. So our, our federal grants are going further. The government money is going further when we do it in partnership with the private sector. And we're, we're building systems together. We're not just infrastructure systems and data systems, but also communications and marketing and policy systems together in a collaborative manner that just makes everybody feel better about the investment. Thanks. And James, one of the questions I often get asked is, you know, when you look at the future of cities, what does that mobility ecosystem look like? You know, we've seen a lot of changes in COVID where cities have completely redesigned streets, shut down lanes, put in bike lanes, scooter lanes. We don't know how sticky that is. And like you, I lived in Japan five years, so I've seen good good transit. Um, but still, I mean, bicycles were everywhere and it was it was messy. Um, you know, what do you what do you foresee in this mobility ecosystem? What kinds of products are still to be developed or are needed to fill some of the gaps that exist today? Yeah, thank you, Carla. So I think um, all of us are seeing uh, a rethinking of how we move. And as I mentioned, the mobility of goods and people and information connected together uh, with uh, some new technology has opened up new possibilities. Um, one of the things that we are really looking at is uh, different form factors um, away from the traditional car. Uh, there's different types of mobility devices, uh, personal mobility, uh, you know, the scooters obviously uh, as, as one option, but then how do you organize it? How do you uh, make it better? How, how do you come up with charging infrastructure or uh, make availability that's safe and uh, clean and not as messy as you mentioned? Um, I think there's a huge untapped potential for things that we could do better if we had smarter uh, mobility. And that's one of the reasons we're investing in that. Uh, I'll just mention one example. Um, computer aided design tools have dramatically accelerated the engineering uh, iterations that we're able to do when we're building electromechanical systems. Uh, but for our cities, there isn't an equivalent digital tool 
and uh, that would allow us to do sort of uh, thought experiments. And that's something that we're building as part of Woven City is a digital twin of the city that allows us to actually generate and synthesize and simulate uh, mobility patterns. Therefore, we could run giant optimizations and say, okay, for 10,000 residents, how many personal mobility devices would meet peak demand at different times? Where would be the optimal locations for charging stations? And, uh, um, and then really uh, run those simulations uh, so that we have better design choices. Um, it comes back to data and it come back, comes back to patterns of behavior. We won't be able to make good decisions unless we can understand people's uh, patterns of behavior. And so as Michael uh, has mentioned, uh, you know, having data about commuting um, can obviously lead to better choices in terms of public infrastructure uh, investments. And so that's something that I think we can uh, utilize and will accelerate much more in the future as we connect digital technologies, new mobility solutions, and then uh, public infrastructure investments and incentives mm -hmm. for behavior. Uh, essentially, we'd like to provide people choices and uh, provide mm -hmm. clean, safe choices. And Absolutely. Getting people to use them, getting people engaged with that process was your question. And comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Comfortable with yeah. it. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to get to the population to get their feedback. And we a part of what we're trying to do at Hitch is take them from where they are today to tomorrow. So our next question, we stole it out of the, uh, we're going to invite Amy up here and thank you, Carla. Um, you're, you're very welcome. Thank Thanks. you so much. Uh, Amy Ford is with the, um, she's the vice president of public policy and mobility on demand with ITS America. So Amy, you have, I'm sure more questions than I do. So I'll turn it over to you and step off. We do, and I, I'm fortunate to look at some of the questions that are coming in, so I might combine a couple of them uh, so that people can ask. But, you know, the first is really to Michael, and I, I used to be at the Colorado Department of Transportation, where I was the chief of advanced mobility, and we, too, were looking at these kinds of frameworks where you think about incentives for, for people's behavior, and actually paying them is really a unique approach, right? 10 cents a mile, 25 cents a mile, whatever we choose. How did you crack the nut of freeing up federal funds for that? And whether it's SGBD or you know, someone asked here uh, whether you could use CMAQ funds for that, obviously we all know there are quite a few benefit cost analysis ratios that you have to do when you spend federal funds. And so how, how did you guys decide to do that? Yeah, right. I mean, is it worth it to even interject federal funding into the mix? Yep. Well, and it is worth it if you don't have another op option, right? And I think we see the federal funding as the stimulant to sort of get this momentum moving forward and then it probably becomes self-sustaining as other investors step into the game i think uh, you know short of citing specific regulations with you right now online we could we could talk about that offline but i, I think the conversation that we have federal highway administration and tdot was one that recognized multiple angles to this mm -hmm. um, there's a data acquisition angle uh, there's a planning and analysis angle that comes from the product that we're purchasing through hitch and then on the issue of incentives, it's, you know, in a lot of the, the regs, as you know, Amy, it's um, in the way that Federal Highway is, uh, is structured across, and it's often a, a state division office, uh, state division administrator is helping mm -hmm. to interpret those rules. So anything I say here right now may not apply in your state, you know, yep. depending on that interpretation that is held locally, uh, for better or worse. Um, but I think uh, in, in terms of incentives, you know, we were able to to point to uh, places where we have maybe not paid the person directly for a trip, but we have paid for trips, whether it's bus seat guarantees on public transit, where we're helping to do operational subsidies and in a capitalized way in some cases for public transit or uh, in TDM programs where we're um, investing in things that are aimed at shifting behaviors. And so we came at it from a couple of different angles and, and, and I credit our Federal Highway Division Administration for um, seeing a few of these angles on their own, especially the data acquisition angle, because I think the data in and of itself is probably worth the investment that we're making. We spent a ton of money on data. We're talking about a nine and a half dollar investment over a few years. It's going to get us a ton of data that's also going to reward people for, for good personal decisions uh, in their mobility. Thanks. I appreciate that. I'll indulge on one more question. I know there's some others, but James, I'm curious, this integration of incentive, incentivizing behavior, payment slash pricing slash monetary incentives 
and the integration with their built environment, like what you guys are doing with your woven project, you know, the idea that a vehicle may have the capacity to be incentivized with different behavior, hey, drive at a different time, park here, I don't don't leave now. And that, that also attaches to the mobility on demand concept of let's say it's a shared mobility services providing that behavior for the individual who rides in said vehicles. Are you guys starting to look at that kind of integration within the Toyota framework of what you guys are doing, where it, it compares the vehicle, the pricing, the behavior patterns within the use of the infrastructure and then how the individuals may attach because I may not always be riding in the same individual, I, I, in the same vehicle. I know that's a big question, but I think that's one where everyone keeps thinking this is where we could go, but um, how we prove that out is tricky. Yeah, and so one of the things that I've been starting with is building a team that will create uh, a software platform for uh, you know, Toyota vehicles to start with, but the idea that you would essentially have an easy way to program and interact with a mobility device uh, and with smart infrastructure in the city. Uh, we do have V2X, which essentially means vehicle to anything. We can find the states of traffic lights. We could find the states of uh, crosswalks, uh, and the vehicle can understand that, and, and we can make safer decisions uh you know our technology goal is really to be able to build a mobility solution uh like a car that would never hit a person um, and can we make it smart enough that no even if the driver does the wrong thing um it still will not hurt anyone um and uh, i think we're getting closer we're seeing automatic emergency braking you know we brought uh pedestrian avoidance uh uh you know our lexus cars can swerve up to 1.4 meters in lane to avoid hitting a person, even if the driver does nothing. Um, and that'll get smarter and get better over time. But I think your point about uh, the connected infrastructure, how do we realize it? I think, uh, you know, smartphones, and that's why the Hitch platform is so interesting, is because we now have geolocation data. And if we build good infrastructure to preserve privacy and uh, have good security, then we can have these solutions deployed with confidence. Uh, and that's something that uh, obviously, you know, is a, also a big uh, challenge for everyone. But to me, creating these programmable mobility ecosystems is is really at the heart of trying to uh, lay the foundation for these innovative new uh, applications that can incentivize good behavior and provide people choices. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to use executive authority because there's a customer in the audience who's asked a question, wants to ask a question of James Kepner. Yeah. I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, the CEO of Murakami USA. It's our newest client. And the part of the thing that captures my attention is that we talk a lot about the urban environment and the urban built environment. What about Campbellsville, Kentucky, the rural 300 uh, staff you know, manufacturer that's trying to get people back to work. Um, and I, I, I keep trying to anchor us in, our purpose today is to try to get the citizen's journey to the, the buy-in to the city of tomorrow. We're doing that with crazy simple interface and a crazy simple concept where you can be carbon zero and get paid small cash amounts in order to participate and document your process. Uh, Murakami has just recently implemented our system, and and by the way, I gotta congratulate you, Michael Rodenberg, for winning the Assembly Magazine Assembler of the Year for the United States. You know, question. You know, we we're very excited about kind of being one of the first implementers of Hitch in a rural area. You know, we struggle with um, like in so many places with workforce, and we're hoping that this will be an opportunity to reach out to a demographic. Uh, that normally uh, wouldn't have access to transportation. And so we're just starting to do some some initial implementation of it, and we think there's going to be some great opportunities. Uh, but I think, um, you know, to the larger question about rural communities, for me, um, we have seen, uh, especially in Japan, uh, declining rural populations, which means that people uh, are reducing train service, reducing bus service, um, and then it makes the problem worse because you get a downward spiral. Uh, you have aging populations. Uh, so people, you know, whether we like it or not, almost all of us will eventually lose the ability to drive. Um, that's another reason why this technology is so important because you lose a lot of freedom uh, when you lose mobility. And, and, and so uh, if you think about an elderly person who needs to 
uh, get around, maybe lives in the in the rural areas, if they're seeing uh, bus service and train service getting cut, how are they going to get around? Uh, and so I think uh, mobility on demand um, and shared uh, services, uh, being able to find out when a ride is available uh, through a hitch uh, uh, could be also very interesting and provide people options. So I think there's uh, all kinds of benefit. Uh, you know, we focus about cities, but it really also affects the rural side as well. Excellent. Thank you. I think we're going to see because of this recent uh, pandemic that more and more people are kind of moving to the countryside because they, at least here in the U.S., because they have the opportunity to, to, to work remotely. So we're going to see how that, that impacts us as well. So thank you for, for taking my question. Thank you. There, there is a, the, the number one question that we received was from uh, Vicki Lewis. It got the most votes as we were upvoting the questions. And the question was, um, but her question was about ready to be produced. There she is. Hi, Mark. And thank you, Jane. So my name is Vicki Lewis and I'm in the city of Detroit. I am the president and CEO of VMX International. We're an environmental firm. We specialize in transportation and disposal and recycling of waste. We do a lot of work and very, very interested in, in uh, uh, electric vehicles and such. But my question has to do more with the urban community and with mass tr uh, transit being so limited. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, how are you addressing and getting your arms around um, getting folks um, in the urban community to, first of all, share rides, be encouraged to share rides, um, secondly, to feel comfortable writing with folk that they might not know. I think that there's a, an excellent opportunity for a cultural um, coming to minds and meeting and, and exchange. And um, also, how are you uh, getting that community, the urban community, which I'm part of, involved and to hear what it is that they're interested in with this excellent concept of pitch. Yeah. That was a lot, wasn't it, James? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's an excellent question. And I think, you know, part of the challenge is that uh, we do uh, want to provide safe, clean infrastructure and mobility choices for people. Uh, but people should have the freedom to make those choices. So if somebody uh, prefers, uh, they can travel by themselves, but if they have good incentives or if we have um, the right infrastructure and make it easy uh, or they can be rewarded, then uh, we can um, reduce traffic and we can reduce pollution and also provide other opportunities for people to uh, get to know each other uh, through these shared rides. Of course, it's challenging with COVID, uh, but I believe that that is the future, that we will be able to have communities that where people can uh, live happy, healthy lives and have choices for safe mobility, uh, getting around uh, conveniently. And to me, I think um, the technology part is just one part. Um, it also has a lot to do with uh, our culture and our governments and our, our communities, how they support that and how they envision that for the future. But I think it's, uh, uh, it's important for companies to invest in green technology to invest in uh, safe transportation uh, for uh, goods, people, and information. And that's really what we've been looking at. I think that the greatest part of this uh, for the urban community is incentivizing, you know, uh, I think pay is very, very mm -hmm. important, more important than anything. I mean, it's one thing to save trees and to be environmentally green and things like that. So I think that the program is a perfect fit uh, for the urban community, and especially with some of these uh, the automotive companies building their facilities and having a way to, um, and well, actually, what has happened is some of the facilities are built, and they get and the OEMs get tax credits for um, hiring people within the community. But the challenge is the lack of mobility. How do I get to work? Um, how am I going to, um, who, do I have someone to ride with? How can I be there on time? And I think that this is the answer. I'm just um, wondering how, um, 
it, how we communicate that to this uh, population where they understand that this is something that's good for them. And Michael, um, on your, and I know you put your finger up, Mike, oh. uh, Mark, just one second here. On your, uh, You're in on charge. your program that you've already rolled out, you know, partially, have you run into any challenges within the urban community? Well, yes, yeah, so we haven't rolled it out yet, Vicki. We're sort of getting oh, okay. into the final stages of that. But I think I appreciate your question because whether or not we're successful, this is what we're going to test. We're going to test. Is there is there an incentive level that actually drives behavioral changes to address some of the social equity needs that we have within the, within the community to get to senior adults who don't have great mobility or ability to drive or low-income uh, neighborhoods that you just don't have great mobility solutions available to them? What is that? sort of magic threshold that changes behaviors. But I think I'd say you, you were about to mention communication. Uh, so let me extend, get to that too, because I think that the, the platform is amazing, uh, is an amazing tool, but we need to build those trust networks and circles. And that, the, the platform itself isn't gonna do that. And so yeah. thinking about our communication is a marketing strategy in a multifaceted way. It's not you just put it out, put, put, out, put out an app and billboards. I mean, we need to really, leverage the peer to peer networks that have made other emerging technologies very successful. People trust mm -hmm. their peers much more than they do government. And so I think we have to be really creative about how we um, get into the neighborhoods that we're trying to, uh, to realize benefits. And that's gotta be done on a, on a personal level more than a systematic level, to be honest with you. At least in the piloting stage is when you're trying to understand what actually does drive behaviors more than anything else. I'm super charged well, that you recognize that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And uh, I would say that when we got started, we didn't have, we ha when we got started with this project, we had Nissan, which shout out for them funding and rewarding and experimenting with us. This connected vehicle kind of group uh, saw a potential to test and experiment. And with, uh, with that, we gathered together the community of business leaders here in Nashville, the Nashville Chamber and others. And by the time we got done, we had a quarter million dollars worth of cash rewards that were run through the system that got us these 13 million miles of, of awesome experience. And we're going to need a lot more experience as we go forward. Great. That brings me to the uh, idea that on December 2nd, we are having another event where we'll dive into this specific topic really deeply. And credit to the Greater Nashville Regional Council for studying the highly vulnerable population. Um, and, and looking at ultimately, we're all going to be looking at ways to get people engaged today as we head towards this, this experience that we want to provide as leaders tomorrow. Um, and thank you again, James, for your, your uh, participation today. I think we're running late because we got a little started late. Let's, let's move to just a, a moment of, of, of reflection and networking as we are uh, going to pop out of the presentation mode and let everybody enjoy their afternoon and evening. Thank you so much for joining us and look forward to seeing you on December 2nd. Thank you. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you.